Thursday again. Yay! It's the reason that I get up on Monday. Good after evening. Good morning. Good day. How are you? Welcome to Adromeda. Another Thursday session where we get together to talk tech and, wow, well, almost mangled things. Uh, man, weird thing happened 27 minutes ago. Uh, I came in and started doing setup and things were not working and, you know me, the internet was down and I, I did as much as I could with dead internet. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, it, it came back, thank goodness, in about 10 minutes, but I, I didn't even have a, a good way to put up a message to say, excuse me bag the show for lack of internet i guess i probably could have used i got hiccups already <clears throat> doesn't usually happen until later in this show i could have made a hot spot out of my phone and at least enough to get a message out and i probably would have tried to do the show on it but uh with the internet is flaky i'm looking at everything i'm doing here my image looks very slow to me it looks bad i suspect we're going to be way out of audio and video sync i did play with that this week but i haven't got massive amounts of success yet but and it's basically because of lack of time they they just loaded me up like nobody's business this week but you're here i'm here so let's make the best of it shall we let's shrink that let's get these notes up invisible and hey we are i got a fun show today uh and it's not too long we won't run long on this and Man, it, it's it's just pure fun. I'm, I'm loving what we can do with this thing. Anyway, so it is Thursday. We uh, This is Andromeda. Andromeda, like Andromeda without the N. Another Dave Rush, Ask Me Anything Digital Alchemy. Uh, and I um, we're here because you love technology. I love technology, all kinds. And we like to play with it. We like to showcase it. We like to use it. And that's what this show is about. It's uh, identifying technology and its impact on our day-to-day -day lives. So, topics range all over the place. Computers and IT, security, energy, automation, AI, music, movies, electric cars and electric guitars and all points in between and beyond. And we're not afraid to delve into the uh, controversial topics. So whatever you got in mind, we'll talk about that for a half an hour. We'll do a show. Uh, we'll do a project in about a half an hour. And then uh, we'll shoot the breeze for the last 10, 20 minutes. Something like that. So, eep, op, orc, ah, uh, ah. Uh, and as far as you know, I am wearing pants. Are you ready for this? I have been thinking for a couple of months about getting a kilt. I know there's 45 reasons not to get a kilt when you're an old man in the middle of Houston. <laughs> But there's a couple reasons for it, and I don't know exactly where this motivation comes from other than, you know, outside of Scotland and, and fancy dress parties, costume parties, uh, where you see guys wearing kilts. Uh, but there is a place here in the U.S. where you see them worn regularly, frequently, pick your adjective, uh, and that is on Forged in Fire. And, and you see these guys, and a couple of them turn up in tartans, but mostly when they wear them, they're using uh, cargo utility kilts. And I go between the two. Uh, I go between, that is really stupid. Why would you wear a kilt in a forge in 2023? Okay. <laughs> You're not wearing it because it's practical or good for forging. You, you, the only reason to wear a kilt is because you're trying to brand an image, right? But there they are, they turn up in them, and you know, I, I think, hey, that's stupid, it looks stupid, it is stupid, but it's kind of cool. And then I think, where would I wear one other than, I, I guess I'd have to build a forge. <laughs> I don't know. But it, it's been on my mind, and I have definitely been shopping. Uh, if I pick up something really cheap, if nothing else, it turns into uh, something for Halloween. I don't know if I ever told you this. My mother did a million things. She was a, an amazing lady. Uh, side businesses, major businesses, hustles, whatever. And one of her little side businesses 
was as a costumer uh, or a, a costume provider. She was kind of like a one-woman costume shop. She didn't have a storefront or anything like that, but her closets were just packed with everything that you can imagine. You know, not the, the, the stuff you get from Woolworths. Anybody remember that? Uh, you know, $4 kids' costumes or, uh, you know, all the big retailers right now. She she had or, or constructed or built realistic costumes. Her big favorite was clowns. Her and my sister and my nieces, they would all get together and clown, go to hospitals and do all that stuff. But, you know, if I call up and say, Mom, I need a pirate costume. Okay, when do you want it shipped? She had it. And I can see that. So I have a few of those things that I loved before, she, or I guess after she passed. Uh, and there's just some amazing stuff in there. So this would be something to add to the collection. Uh, let me tease something here just a little bit. I, I want to tease you a little bit about the show today. I resized all these images today, and they don't fully fill... Yeah. So we're going to be doing a project today where uh, we're using a utility that's a single function graphic editing utility that I guess it does two functions. One, it removes backgrounds and two, it uh, takes the removed backgrounds and makes them transparent. I'll get into the reasons and rationale on that. Uh, but so this is one of the images that we're going to work with. Here's one we're going to work with. This one is really tricky. Uh, especially as you get around the kind of this fuzzy furry area how the the system detects edges and things like that and then it comes up with results that are something like this here's our astronaut and then here is our astronaut and he's got a transparent background let me prove that and there we go so there's a solid image and with transparent backgrounds you can do some uh, really cool things with images by putting them in graphics and things like that so Oops, I hit the wrong button there. I don't know what that's going to do. Okay. You brighten up again and the world's back to scratch. All right, so tech news of the week. I'm not real current in the last two, three days, but over the, over the last five or six or seven, I picked up some tech news. So let's share. Uh, you're going to love this one or you're going to hate this one. I don't know. Because uh, I don't exactly know what to think about this one. Uh, cars need roads. Okay, that's a fair assessment and assumption. And cars wear out roads. They damage roads. They make potholes when they're big and heavy. And, you know, every time you make a turn, even just a little tiny correction, you are eroding away a little bit of your tires and a little bit of the road. So all cars damage roads. And so... New roads have to be made, old roads have to be repaired, and that ain't free. And so where does that money come from? Well, it comes from state gasoline taxes. Technically, federal gas taxes as well. That's a, a big discussion someday, and there's boondoggleism in there. But uh, each state charges its own state gas tax, and it's used for managing state-funded roads, and they give them to, to grant them to cities and things like that. Uh, so it's all coming out of fuel, right? State gas tax. Electric cars don't pay for gas taxes. So they are not paying into the, uh, the general fund for building new roads and maintaining existence one. Texas, I have a, a wrong note here, it is not the first state, but Texas has joined the list of states. So let's just take, get rid of the word first there. I correct this stuff because it's all archived and, and ready to go. I just need to get it up on the web server so you can all take this stuff. Anyway, so Texas is now applying a highway tax to electric vehicles. Starting September 1st of this year, new EV purchasers will pay an additional $400 in fees. So they're calling fees, not road taxes, but that's what it is. Uh, in addition to all the other fees and taxes that you pay when you purchase one. And then all EV owners will pay $200 a year in road fees, highway taxes, whatever you want to call them. Uh, 
Uh, otherwise, if you don't pay that, then you don't get your registration. You have to re-register in Texas every year, and uh, in order to do that here in Texas, you have to get inspected. You get your emissions inspected. You get your taillights inspected and your brakes and all that happy stuff. And uh, you cough up your couple of bucks for that. It's not expensive, and especially for me, uh, I own diesel cars. Uh, they don't do an emissions test on me, so I'm quicker, and it, it cost me eight dollars. And then they sign the form, and you send the form and money into the Capitol, and a couple of days later, they send you back a sticker that you put in your window. It's got a big number on it representing the month that you're registered in, and that big number is there so that cops can see it. I know this. This happened to me one time. Uh, I was a month or two out of inspection or out of registration, and I got pulled over on the way to work, and uh, the guy wrote me a ticket. And he said, look, all you got to do is get inspected, get a new new sticker. You go to court, and they will waive this. I thought, well, you know, what are you getting out of it then? Because you're not getting any revenue. But I did it, and sure enough, they waived that. Oh, but they don't waive the court costs, do they? Anyway, so there's my own little boondoggle. But uh, we're not the only state to do that. There's a whole bunch of states, including our friend Tullowood, who's here. Uh, California, Alabama, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, Ohio, Oregon, and Utah all have some kind of EV taxes or fees used to contribute to their fund. I think what's really interesting about this, I ran the numbers and, and checked the numbers here, the Texas revenue for you know, all the, the fees and taxes and gases and everything like that is, where did I put that number? $2.8 billion. The anticipated fee generation with all this happy stuff is going to be 38 million so less than a percent or just barely over a percent so I, I you know I, I don't know what to think about all this i just thought i'd share it but we're not the first there's a half a dozen states doing it and you can bet as big a, a free state anti-taxes texas is if we're doing it everybody's going to do it more in the news if you weren't aware Reddit went dark on Monday, Tuesday. Not every subreddit, but Reddit has proposed some new fees that are going to dramatically impact large subs on there. Now, I subscribe to five subs, and they are all large. They are all in the top 1%. Uh, and these guys are going to wind up paying potentially through other people about 20 million bucks a year right now they pay nothing and so they've decided to boycott and protest reddit saying we're used to this free stuff why should we have to pay now reddit says they're losing 50 million a year and they say when you take all of theirs sorry it's not 50 million a year uh they get 50 million hits a day uh whatever they're losing they're trying to recoup recoup and, you know, there's a lot of argument about the numbers that they're charging. Uh, it's comparable to Twitter premium fees. You know, it's going to be basically a, a premium three, uh, fee. Other people are comparing it. Yeah, but it's way more expensive than this service. This is a premium thing. And the answer is, yeah, because they have much lower subscriber rates. So... You know, I'm a capitalist. I, I think everybody ought to pay their way a fair price. But, you know, if you're in the top 1%, you're going to be paying a lot more than somebody who's got 500 subscribers. So I, I looked at the numbers of the, the things that I hang on to. My my, my five subs that I, I, I'm an actual member of, CompTIA, 173,000 subscribers. And they went restricted, which means you could read posts. Uh, we thought you were going to be able to add comments to posts, but they killed that. So they went semi-private. All you could do was read posts. Uh, Ubuntu, 216,000 users. Raspberry Pi, 3.2 million users. Raspberry Pi Projects, 135,000 users. And Pi Hole, 154,000 users. Uh, so these are all top one percenters. So obviously anything over 100,000 puts you in the top 1%, maybe even uh, significantly less. Again, I don't know what to think about it. Other than I, I believe everybody ought to pay their fair share. They've been getting it free for since Reddit's been in existence in the mid-90s. 
So it won't. It's not the subs that get charged. The people who are going to get charged if you're into this thing is uh, there are third party folks who have created utilities for managing subs, subreddits, and they're the ones who are going to be charged. They're being charged for access to the internal guts, the API, the application programming interface to Reddit's services. So if you're using Joe's super mod software for every X amount of hits that you're going to make, they're going to charge you a certain amount of money. Now, they're not using their own software to do that. They provide it to the subreddit operators. So they're going to have to charge the, the subreddit operators and will the subreddit operators be willing to pay that? The ones who are boycotting say they won't and they'll disappear. And, and you know, there's a, an interesting argument. I'm going to quit. I'm leaving Reddit because it won't let me have their services for free anymore. I'm going to go and make a Discord server. Well, you know, when they do that and they bring over 3.4 million users, then Discord is going to get swamped and they're going to say, you know what, you guys are going to have to start coughing up some money. We're, we're losing money here. Again, just an interesting bit of topic. Hey, let's see who's here. We'll come back and do more news in a moment. All right, that's good. <laughs> Highland Games. Sorry, I'm scrolling all the way back up to the top. I'll get back into that thing. Patricia Grace. We have Highland Games that go from county to county. Okay. I, I don't think I've ever seen Highland Games here in Texas other than in... Uh, uh, the the uh, <laughs> now I can't think of the, the two medieval organizations, but you know what I'm talking about. We have hello, 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 Abu Bakr Al Hajj. Good afternoon, my friends. Salam alaikum. Dear Lord, help me. When I click emojis, they try to force me to use a pride one. <laughs> Patricia's got all of the Hawaiian flower emojis, as does Tullawit and pineapple. Man, I miss pineapple. I, I use this powdered drink stuff to flavor my water because I have to drink so much water now. Uh, and there's a pineapple one. It's a zero sugar. That is like my dessert. I get a couple of those a week. I'm a happy guy. <laughs> uh, Tullowit's got Highland Games. Haven't gone in years. Okay. Yeah, I knew what you meant. Higland Games, if you like. <clears throat> yeah, wouldn't it be cool if you could edit posts on YouTube chat? I edit all my posts. I'm terrible about that. I just, I type, blah, 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 blah. so I miss a key or the key misses the wireless receiver. And then I look back a little while later and it's like, oh man, I can't believe I typoed that. And I have to go in and fix it. Told it's got a new keyboard yesterday. Nice. Has an extra set of keys far left. If I destroy my ability to type, I can't type until I get used to it. <laughs> it is destroyed. Okay. Patricia Grace was reading something about it. Third-party use of their APIs. That's exactly right. So they have their own app, and you can access by web. Those are their two free methods that they're not going to change. But if you're accessing their API with a third-party app, then you get to cough up. 999 Discord member. 999! Ah, we're going to hit 1,000. I want to... Tell it. If you see it happen while the show is on... Give me a screen cap of when it says 1,000. Anybody who sees that 1,000th, I, I need a screen cap of that, just a picture. Uh -oh. ah, we're going to hit 1,000. So excited. Jason Helms is here. Hoping everybody is well. And we are by Grapthar's Hammer, by the sons of Warvan, you shall be avenged. <laughs> Man, I just get goosebumps. I love that movie so much. Maybe we should do MySpace. <laughs> All right. Just have a pizza with pineapple. I can have pizza. I, 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 the concept of cauliflower crust leaves me cold. But I use keto bread and chop it up into a cylindrical or circular format. And I put it in a round plate bowl. Uh, and then I put all my pizza toppings on that and nuke it. But no pineapple. And I love pineapple on my pizza. 
man, as we all know. Celebrate the thousandth. So will I. We are all stoked for this. It took us two years to get to 500. It took us four months to get to a thou. And it's going to get better. Kathy's got marketing plans up the wazoo. This is going to get monstrous. Uh, okay, get the screen cap. Doesn't give total count. That's all right. We'll do what we can here. Go to server settings, then to members. Right. Yeah, and you don't even have to click on server settings. You if you if you click on settings, then you can just down in the lower right hand corner of that, or the, the near the bottom, next to the last entry, is member count. Nuked pizza. Yeah, I know, but I the way I make it, I can't put it in an oven. <laughs> All right, back to uh, other tech news of the week. Angie, not Angie's list. But Angie, Angie was in the news this week. I wasn't aware of Angie or I've forgotten about it because the news was about the latest update. So I dove into it. Angie, you know that, that there are two big web server products out there. There is, was Apache and there is, was Nginx, N-G-I-N-X. And Apache ruled the world for a decade nginx added more features and it's it's every bit as good if not better than apache and it took over right now nginx is the single most popular web server running on servers on the internet uh, nginx handles about one third of all web traffic on the internet well some of the <coughs> some of the folks uh senior developers at nginx which is a russian organization split off and formed their own web server company and they created a competing product to nginx and it's called angie it's a total drop-in replacement for nginx and it has additional features including making for free all of the features that are only available in the paid version of nginx so bigger better stronger faster freer and my notes here say, bring up the article and hit the highlights. No, just look up Angie. Uh, what I really love about this, besides that, is it is as FOSS as you get, free and open source. It uses what's called the, the BS2 license. Any use, commercial, private, personal, whatever makes you happy, full rights to change the code. Just mention you're using the BSD2 license and you can do anything you want with their code. That's that's amazing it's incredibly good software and it's a incredibly accessible to anybody loving that stuff all right there are satellites that circle the earth all the time eight thousand of them in polar rotating orbits and then there's dozens or hundreds of uh geostationaries well all of these moving satellites get in the way of astrophotography and astro measurement from telescopes radio telescopes and everything that they, they impact that hubble oh and some of these satellites exist beyond the orbits of the big space telescopes hubble and webb so if they're doing a long exposure you're going to get streaks across it Oh, come on, Dave. What are we talking about here? Let me share with you, won't I? All right. So this handy-dandy little streak going center left to top right, that's a satellite streak. Well, they, Hubble encountered this a lot, and the Hubble developers and uh, folks who, who work on the images that get downloaded from that, they solved that. But all the earthbound telescopes and new web, they had to come up with their own. Well, they have. That's the news of the week. Uh, everybody who's doing uh, imagery, satellite imagery, or not satellite imagery, uh, hi, even satellite imagery too, uh, but telescope imagery has worked together to create this great new software to get rid of the streaks. And the way they do it basically is multiple exposures and make sure that 
Uh, they get some before and some after, and then they can kind of merge them all together. Uh, a little more sophisticated than that, of course. But Hey, by the way, satellite count. Uh, 1990, there were 470 orbiting satellites. Today, about 8,000. So, <laughs> it's like land, or it's like ocean. They, they just keep making more. All right, that's all the news I have of the week. What do we got here time-wise? 25, okay. Uh, personal stuff. And again, it's technology. It's not just personal. Clonezilla. So I have had for some time, I mentioned this last week. I started this last week. I'm getting into it a little bit more today. Uh, I have a uh, my daily driver had it came with a, a 500 gigabyte M2 SSD. And it's a real NVMe one. And I purchased a two terabyte one and have been waiting for the opportunity to get it installed and, and pick the right method to do that. So, hey, lo and build, this is the 512 M2. And there isn't two M2 slots. There isn't a pair of slots in my system. So I said, well, I'll, uh, I'll get an M2 enclosure over there, there we go. And I'm not going to pull this out. Trust me, there's an M2 enclosure and it's USB 3 and it's nice and fast and wonderful and cool. So I hooked those up and hooked it into the computer and it didn't get recognized and a lot of troubleshooting later and it turned out I had it plugged into the wrong computer. <clears throat> so I figured that problem out and now what I have to do is I've got to duplicate the internal M2 drive to this external M2 drive block by block duplicate and then all I have to do is pull out the internal one pop in that one that was external and it should boot up and operate no problem all I need is a method a tool to perform that duplication Patricia Grace threw this out some time ago and I added it in my notes to look into uh, a lot of other people put a lot of other ideas what did you just do there But there came a point where so many people said, Clonezilla, Clonezilla, Clonezilla. I said, all right, I'm going to do what everybody else does so I can learn about it. I can speak about it intelligently if necessary. So Clonezilla. Clonezilla is a magic piece of software. You put it on bootable media. It's an operating system. In fact, it's Debian. And it has one program installed into it. And that's Clonezilla. So you boot up from this thing with the two drives that you want to duplicate, and there's way more than that, uh, and then you just follow the menus and say, pick the source drive, pick the destination drive, hit the go button, I'm simplifying of course, and the source duplicates to the target, and you're done. And that's what happened. So let's do this. Clonezilla can do so much. We can set up a computer that's got a master image on it. It could be an image file. It could be the hard drive. All, uh, could be just a partition. And then we set up a Clonezilla server and then Clonezilla clients. You just boot this with the, the bootable Clonezilla disk. And now you tell the server, hey, use this as a source. Use as many of these as you want as clients and go man go so that's one way to do it this is the same thing just a slightly different image you can take a non raid disk and clone it to a raid array is that some magic what i did was disk to disk and any two disks that the computer can see and that's what's really cool about this the source disk can be an internal or an external disk on the machine or it can be a remote disk or partition someplace else. Same for the target. Could be attached to the machine, internal or external. Could be a remote target out there. So Clonezilla is amazing, powerful, flexible, freaking magic is the only way to put this thing. Uh, I love this. I am a convert. So the only question left is uh, what am I going to do with this 500 gigabyte M2 drive. It's, I didn't wipe it. 
Oh, by the way, so once you're done, I take my 500 gigabyte drive and I've cloned it to a two terabyte a terabyte drive, huh? Well, what happens then? This, I just took this screenshot today. A little tough to spot. This is G parted. So here's the 500 gigs that it cloned. And here's the one and a half terabytes, 1.4 terabytes of unallocated space. So I've got to allocate that partition and do whatever I'm going to do with it. But I have things in mind for it. So I mean, it's just magic. It's just magic, says my Scottish friend. Hey, old news. But I can finally take this off my list now. My staircase is done. I finished it over the uh, the Labor Day weekend here in the States two weeks ago. Uh, I had to wait two weeks for the last coat to harden. It hardened. It was done on Tuesday. And for the first time on Tuesday, I walked up the stairs with my shoes on. And I felt guilty about it. And I still carry, you know, I'm now back to carrying my shoes up and down the stairs. It's gorgeous. It's amazing. It's wonderful. Basically... I am now fully recovered from the flood that happened in November of 21. I can show you this thing. My wife got a, a new job six months ago working here remotely. They gave her a laptop. They gave her three monitors. Well, one's the laptop display. And in order to run the three monitors, they gave her this. Comes with a power supply as well. It's a dock. More importantly, it's a Thunderbolt dock that supports uh, two display ports and an HDMI port. So you got to have a thun uh, your the Thunderbolt on your computer has to support display port to use this thing. But you plug it in, and then you can plug in up to three more monitors. The company gave her two more. She uses them. I said, I love that idea. I want to do that on my system here. Let me borrow that and test it. And it wouldn't work on any of my machines, including my uh, Linux boxes. It's got a USB-C connector on it. And I didn't realize that it was a Thunderbolt connector, so plugging this into USB-C, USB ports, does nothing. All right. Then the other day, I'm looking, while I'm playing around with these M2 drives, that there is a port on there that's got a Thunderbolt symbol on it. And I didn't know if it supported DisplayPort, but I said, let me borrow your hub again, your dock, and test that using that port on my Linux box, right? There was no configuration. There was nothing. Plug it in, plug in three monitors, plus the main one that I always have plugged into it, and they just all came up in, in extended mode, no questions asked, nothing. It's it's magic. I got three knucks. I will have three of those docks as soon as humanly possible. All right. I'm running a tad long, but there's a couple things that I got to share with you still. There's a store, uh, a surplus junk store in uh, my neck of the woods that on Mondays, they sell everything in the store for a dollar. On Tuesdays, 50 cents. Wednesdays, two bucks, three bucks, four bucks, five bucks. Never goes more than five bucks. So I went down there. We just discovered it, uh, you know, some Saturday and went in there and said, not paying five bucks for all this stuff. But uh, there's a couple things that I, I'm curious about. Actually, I did. So I looked at this and said, you know, I'll, I'll take a risk for five bucks. I'm going to share this with you in a second. <clears throat> Uh, then I went back down on Tuesday with my kid uh, on, on a lunch break, and uh, we bought 30-some-odd HDMI cables and a bunch of other goodies <laughs> and cleaned the place out. This is an Eric Hill, E-R-I-C-K, Eric Hill, one word, RT100 electromagnetic force tester. It's a bug detector. It's an RF detector. So all you do with this puppy, it's designed for one thing, but I've got it for another thing. It's designed to 
identify areas of radio frequency uh, transmission that are potentially hazardous. So if you get too close to one, let me see if I can stick this close to my phone and make it do its thing. It, it gets very upset with iPhones, but my phone is a lot friendlier. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay, you can see it turned red. Uh, I got the audio thing turned off. So that's a purpose for it if you're concerned about RF impacting your body. But I'm looking at it from another perspective. This is a heat mapper, right? If I want to go around and find the quietest electronic place to put my wireless access point, I'm going to hunt the place around and I'm going to mark and identify places that have high concentrations of radio frequency. I'm not going to put my wrap, my WAP there in areas that have low concentrations. Uh, that's a good place for a WAP as long as it meets the needs of my customers and my clients and so forth. So 20 bucks on eBay. Okay. You're probably not going to find it for five, but you can get them for 20 bucks and that is worth every nickel of it. All right. That's all the junk on there that I want to share. No one more thing. I won't do the long version of this. After screaming and dying and fighting with uh, the folks with whom I placed an order for Raspberry Pis a year and a half ago, and there was another year plus, almost a year and a half to go, before they delivered a surprise batch of a part of that order came in. And they sent me four Raspberry Pi 4 8 gig models. I got four gig models on order. I've got some other models on order, but these little gems are the ones that came in. I have been holding off on opening just so I could do this for you. I got to pay retail price for them. When I ordered them, they were 75. They went up two bucks. So fine, I paid $77 for them and I am one happy faced camper. Last thing. I'm just showing off toys right now. This is show and tell. Uh, but some of the folks who watch this thing are amateur radio operators, as am I. I had a good day on Goodwill. There are ham radio operators who shop on Goodwill. There's a lot of people who shop on Goodwill and don't know what everything is. I picked up more than this. A whole bunch of, of, of an MFJ stack of radios. Uh, if you're a ham, I got a 6 meter uh, SSB here and a 40 meter CW rig. Uh, that's Morse code. Uh, and I won't tell you what I paid for it because you'll have a heart attack and die and cut your own wrist on the way down. But They were giving them away! Uh, every year at the end of June, they, there is a contest called Field Day where you go out in the field as if there were some communications emergency and you operate 100% on generators and solar and whatever. Uh, so you need low power radios or you need high power generators to do. And they bring out big antennas and little antennas. That's my Field Day project for the end of the month. All right, that's everything. That's all the personal news. We're ready for project. Let's check the uh, messages here. Nothing much. Oh, wait. No, it's, there we go. Super scroll. <laughs> I'm still saying, picking up on what you guys said earlier that I looked at. I'll give screen cap. Doesn't give total count. Yeah, okay. You worked out that one out. I found the member count. Good. Patricia Grace. Tollwood finds everything in super awesome detail. You should have seen the stuff that uh, he shared with us tonight. It was great, great information that we're going to turn around and use instantly. Uh, no, I was not talking about mobile. I was talking desktop. I can never find the uh, member count on mobile. If somebody can tell me how to do that. I would love that. Patricia Grace, I'm seeing celebratory signs there. Did we get a thousand? Samsung calls their cloning and partitioning software Samsung Magician. Okay. Terrified to run an EMF tester in my house. Yeah, here too. 
I have multiple WAPs in here and the, the ham gear. <laughs> Jason, where are we at? The discount store sounds up my alley. Oh, man. I, I, <laughs> they, they have so much junk in there, but they have so much cool stuff. I bought a, a Jason hockey mask for 50 cents. You can order and shop online at Goodwill. Man, I hate to have given away my big secret. Yes, it's called shopgoodwill.com. It's an auction. Goodwill does auctions, too. Used to get stuff for craft jewelry. Okay, see, you're there. Spent way too much. Yeah, I've got to stop. I've, I, shopping online has become too easy, and, and I am not being frugal in the last few months. So I, I'm done shopping for a while. i, I got to be a good boy. Uh, on mobile, just tap the three dot menu beside the name of the server. I'll test that when we're done. I got things to do here. All right, cool. Well, that's where we're at. We're caught up on uh, everything. Let's talk about a project here. The project is using machine learning and artificial intelligence to remove background from images using a utility called Background Remover. It's a Linux utility. All right, there's a lot of great image editors out there. Everybody knows the major names, Photoshop, Illustrator, GIMP, Inkscape. It's SC, not SK. <laughs> and there are simple editors or simplified editors. These are editors that have a few common functions in them like resizing and rotating and uh, a variety of image manipulation things. And then there's a third type of image editor, uh, single function editors. There's hundreds, maybe thousands of them out there. And they've all got their place. Full featured editors are powerful. You can do anything with them. But you pay a penalty in the learning curve and in the quantity of resources that they consume on your machine. Nothing's free. But, you know, you get what you pay for and if, if, you're, if you are an editor, if you're a graphic editor, then you need that stuff. Most of us are not. Most of us dabble in graphics when we need to. And so for that, uh, simplified editors have a, a great place as long as the simplified editor has the features that you want in it. There's a little learning curve with them, but it's not. It's certainly nothing like learning uh, Photoshop. And then there are zillions of single function editors out there that do exactly that one or two simple functions uh, there's no learning curve other than you know how to use this thing how to select a source and how to, to modify perhaps uh, the thing that it does so that's what I'm talking about today when I stopped just being a mod on my boss's AMA a couple of years ago uh, and became a producer of it a lot of the other jobs that other folks were doing for the show, I inherited. And one of the things was creating graphics. Beg your pardon. For weekly banners and all kinds of things. And, and with that, uh, somebody might send me a headshot that just was abysmal. And I have to edit that by doing two things. Taking out the background so i got pure headshot no shadows none of that stuff and then taking that background that's now white and making it transparent so i can slide it onto a, a graphic page and and make it an element on that page even if you do it every day that marking out that mapping of the stuff you want to keep is tedious and time consuming but I have to do it regularly enough so sometimes I'll set a, an hour to two hours of my life aside so that I can edit somebody's headshot uh, everything else I've already got well while going down the rabbit hole a week or so ago I found this utility uh, it, it never dawned on me that such a utility existed that would do all this for you and this one in particular because it's uh, got a very good AI for determining where the edges of things are and what a background is. Uh, in that time, I looked up and found there's all kinds of these things out there. There's online ones and there's 
uh, other ones, but I, I looked at this one and, and I tested it and I said, wow, I love that. That's going to be my go-to product from now on. Uh, the name of the product is called, one word, no spaces, background remover. And that will be the name of the command when we get to it. Again, it's a Linux thing. And I picked that because we do a lot of focus on Linux here in the show. Makes kind of sense, right? I The article where I encountered this thing was a combination article and tutorial. So... I let it go until last night. And last night I said, well, I better get this thing installed and tested. And uh, it wasn't good. It, it didn't work. And so up into the wee hours of the morning, as I often am, and I discovered what it takes to make it work and what the, the tutorial writer's mistakes were. Uh, they were pretty abysmal. And I'm not even going to share that tutorial with you. Excuse me. Got a little floating hair. Uh, because it's so bad. Just do what I do. Uh, say what I say. <laughs> and we'll be ready for uh, inspection in the morning. <laughs> All right, let's just dive right into it. Uh, I have already installed some of these things. They're not time-consuming to install. Uh, some things that I care about this thing that I want you to know here. Features. Works with all the common image formats. And interestingly, they say JPG and JPEG and uh, PNGs, of course. Uh, plenty of others. This one knocked me out. It works with videos. So you're playing a video and, you know, that's, it's a headshot and somebody in the background. Maybe it's this one. You could run, take the recording of this video after the show, run it through background remover, and it'll pull out all this background, and it'll just be Dave sitting on a transparent background, yammering away. And you could overlay that on another video, on a still image, whatever. So it works with MP4s, uh, MOV files, and I love this one, even GIFs. Uh, I, I, I once used an online GIF converter. Some of you may remember the, uh, the old drama uh, web server, which is still up and running. You can still get there. Uh, pi r squared dot zapto dot org. It's still up and, and cooking and all of the files and everything are still there. Uh, and you may recall that there is a spinning Raspberry Pi on there and it lives transparently over the background. And it's really cool except for the one little hole in the middle of it. There's a black chip on there that looks like a transparent hole. <laughs> but uh, I, I did that with an online thing. I could do it with this utility now. It's a Python program. It's totally Python. And in theory, that makes it easy to port to other systems, but because of the uh, some of the necessary support files that go with it, there is not yet a uh, Windows or Mac version of this. All right, let's do some sharing here. Uh, we'll start with this. I changed my mind just before the show about how to do this because of some visibility improvers. So this one's a little bigger than if I were to just bring up terminal in uh, in VNC. So I am I've got an SSH connection here to my Intel daily driver, and again I've done a lot of this stuff already. We're going to use a program to install it called PipX. Now we have done in, in past shows a utility used a utility called PIP, uh, which is a Python-based installer package. And it doesn't come native with Ubuntu. Oh. Putty, there we go. PIP. So, oh, I did, I left it installed. I installed it, but normally what would happen, you type in uh, pip and it says command not found. I did install it uh, because of an experiment that I did with this. Uh, but instead, what you're going to use is a program called pipx. And again, it isn't natively installed on Ubuntu. So if you try and run pipx the first time, uh, it's going to say command not found. And so step number one in this project, sudo apt install pipx. If it prompts you for a password, give it one. And it says, hey, you're already current, you're already installed, but
But uh, if it's not installed, it'll give you a quick summary like this and say, uh, it, it needs to be installed. It's going to take up 40 megs or however much space do you want to do it. Yes or no. You say yes. And it took mine about 45 seconds to install. All right. Now we got PipX. Next is to install the program itself. Really simple. PipX. Install. Background. Remover. And you hit the enter key and it will take two and a half minutes if it did on my machine. It's already on there, so oh stop it, you big goober. Okay, that fixed that. And so that's what I did. I installed it, and then the tutorial I was using said, okay, now run it. And uh, a, a warning came up on here that I'm gonna share with you in a second. Uh, but I, I took care of the warning, and then I went and did exactly what the tutorial said, and it said command not found. All you're supposed to do is uh, type in background remover, a path to the source file, a path to an output file, and go. It says not in, in the command not found. And I went to the folder where the command lived, and sure enough, there it was. And, and I tried to run it right from that folder, and it didn't work. So I said, all right, something funky is going on here. I uninstalled it, pipx uninstall background remover. I installed pip and then I installed the program again with pip and that one only took a minute and a half and I thought about that and I said why is this so much faster pip isn't better stronger faster smarter in fact it should be slower and then I realized that the initial installation uh, downloaded and installed some files that took an extra minute that stayed in there and don't hurt anything so okay that one happened faster and then I ran into exactly the same failure mode so I uninstalled it with pip, went back and reinstalled it with pipx, not because I needed to, but because I wanted to see if it was faster this time. And sure enough, it was a, a little under a minute and a half. So, okay, it's installed. It's just not working right. Here's why. Let's try that again. <clears throat> All right, here's a folder that it created, or it installed into, rather. It put all this stuff in here, and it put this guy in here. And notice, if you can see it on your screens, that this is blue where the rest of these are green. Why is that? Let's take a look. So I'll do ls minus la. And, ah, there's the reason. Background remover is a shortcut in here. In Linux, this is called a symlink. And it points to a different program, same name, but in a different directory. Ah, okay, I see your problem there. So there's nothing wrong with running this here in this directory, but that explains why the color changes. So, okay, now why can't I run it? If I type it right now, background remover. All it does is print out some uh, code for me and that's no good well I came to realize that that code is a Python program so to run this program I either have to type in Python 3 and then the name of the program background remover and then any options that come after this or Linux is smart. I can say dot whack and then background remover. And that'll work. That'll invoke it. It'll say, oh, I see that's a Python file. I'll pull up the Python interpreter and give it a run. So that's something that the uh, tutorial totally missed. It just said type in background remover. Now, maybe in his system, he said, had it set up so that Python is always watching in case you try and type the name in of a Python function. But all right, let's get moving here. I have some images that I've created. <clears throat> I didn't create them, I copied them. And let me show them to you. You saw one of them, pictures. 
there's three in here that I'm going to care about today. One of them here is Astronaut on Moon. Okay, He's got a lot of background there, so I'm going to take the background out of that one. You saw the ferret. And then here's a typical headshot to work with. All right, so this is a command line utility. We'll go back to the command line. And I'm going to put in a command, and then I'll explain this, and then we'll run it. That's my installation. Da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -da. Three quarters way down the page here. Okay, so here's the command to run. Putty, 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 right there. All right, so here's the command. We do dot whack and the name of the Python program, minus I for input, and then in quotes, the path and the file name of the thing that we want to remove the background from, and then minus O to specify a newly created output file, and the path and file name of the output file, and notice that the input file is a JPG file, and I made the output a PNG file. It can do that. I've also added to the name NB for no background, so I can keep track of this thing. So we're ready to hit the Enter key on here. Now, the first time you run Background Remover, it's going to take 10 or 20 seconds longer than the next time you run it because it's going to download some analyzer files. But now that we've done that, let's go take a look at what happened. That's not what I expected to see. Oh, there we go. Okay, so here's the astronaut file that it was working with, and here's the one that it just created. So it pulled off all the moon, and it did a fairly good job of edge detection and it made all the background transparent. But you can see there's a little bit of sloppiness on the edge detection here. There's a little bit of moon stuff that he thought might be part of the main image. And same thing over here. So let's go back and run this command again with some more functions to it. Not you. Where am I going? Oh, here, OBS. bring putty back up and I'm going to run the same command and I'm going to add two more parameters here and let's add a, a distinguisher minus a that's going to make an alpha channel on it you don't have to care what that means and then a minus a b which is going to create I'm sorry this is an alpha mat and then this is going to give me details about the alpha mat it's going to put a mat around the image in a color that this number specifies. And one of the things I learned doing this thing is the order of these switches matters. The minus O always has to be the last thing that goes before the output file path. Okay, here we go. Enter. It goes buzz, 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 grind, grind, grind. Buzz, 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 grind, grind, grind. There we go. They're five to ten seconds. Okay, there's our original astronaut. Here's our first effort. And now here's our effort with the mat. Still a little bit sloppy. It's going to need a little bit of, a bit of cleanup here. But you can see that he's put a white mat around the edges of all of this thing. And it's all on the right-hand side right now. Uh, I can do some other things. Uh, work on left side, work on tops, work on bottoms. But cool. Let me do two more quickie demos. Uh, and then we're going to wind this thing up. You'll be able to download all, the, all this from my archive. And then we get ready to close things up. Putty. Right here. And then I'm going to copy and paste the ferret fixes and the headshot fix. And I'll show you the result on all of those. Uh, one of the things I discovered in the process is sometimes the mat makes a difference. 
So now I'm removing the, the rug from the ferret. It's got the NB label on there. That was the astronaut again. <laughs> Where's my ferret line? Way down here. Okay, here's the ferret. Okay, there goes the ferret. We put no background on that one. Now we're gonna do the ferret with a mat. And now I'm going to do my headshot. And my headshot was just abysmal. I shot it here at the house. Uh, I'll remind you how bad it was when I bring it up in a second. Uh, it had this horrible shadow around it that I had to deal with. Uh, make it the same color as the rest of the background. And then I could use a, a, a good editor and take that out. This has taken away all of that work. All right. Buzz, buzz, grind, grind. There we go, all finished. So let's check the results. I'm gonna go back here to start from the beginning. So there's my astronaut. Astronaut, no background. Astronaut, no background with a mat. Here's our sleeping ferret on a fairly complicated little background, lots of differences. And the AI always tries to select the best part of it that's an image it works best if you're uh the image that you're doing is centered and larger than anything else but it's pretty smart okay so we got rid of the background on that he's got a lot of sh fluff here and a little around the top fuzzy fur that kind of makes sense a little bit here so adding the mat totally cleaned that up this thing is ready to go it's production ready Here's my original headshot. Got these horrible shadows all around. That came out pretty good. That is a project that takes me almost an hour to do. And adding the mat on this one did nothing. At least nothing visible. I guess, okay, you can kind of see this. A little bit of my hair disappears here. It kind of picked it up. And yeah, all right, so it did a little bit of something. Hey, that is a single function utility to get rid of backgrounds and make them transparent in Linux. Let's close this, free up some memory here. Yeah, do that. That and that, and no, uh, Sure, save them. Okay, that's gone. Stand by, closing putty. That's just my way. I'm obsessive compulsive. When I'm done with it, I gotta close it. Okay. There's documentation for this thing on all the switches and things like that. I'm gonna put that here in the chat feed for you. And that closes that up. All right, let's look, uh, let's look for last comments and questions, and then we shall wind things up for the day. Hey, by the way, I, I haven't been keeping track. I was looking in my, uh, my list of notes last night and shows and things like that. Uh, time goes fast. This is show number 18. Okay, I was going over here. Oh, I don't want to do that. Well, yeah, I can do that. Nope, I can't. I have to do this. All right, picking up where I left off. Can order again. Will spent way too much. I don't know where you were, where you mean on the desktop. So I right click on a server on the desktop. Well, you you said this. What you said, uh, and then uh, go to settings, and then go to members. I, I presume that's what you're talking about. 
Uh, I'm curious. I don't think it's RFID. Maybe similar. Wanting to make a clone or duplicate of any uh, any advice how to do this. I have never done it personally. I have certainly seen uh, instructions on how to clone RFID, and I'll bet you dollars to donut if anybody knows how to do it off the top of his head, it's Steve Nicholson. So check in with Steve as IT over on uh, the Total Seminars Discord server, and he if he doesn't know how. He will know where to tell you how. I could use the parts. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm gonna tell on you. <laughs> hey, Steve is IT is here. Jason Helms, Proxmark is what we use for our labs. Man, ask and ye shall receive. Hey, Steve. Steve, um, shoot me a note sometime or something uh, tonight or uh, in the morning. Uh, I got a, a, a proposition for you, two of them, uh, that I would like to talk with you. Doing it by text and emails and stuff like that, just not worth it. Uh, it's good stuff for you. I hope it's good stuff for you. We believe it to be good stuff for you. Uh, are they hard to use? This is, uh, still at nine ninety nine. Cool, we made it here. Jason, I'm going to have to sit around and wait for it to happen just so I can come in and do the screen cap when we're ready to go. <laughs> Steve is IT. Dave was right. Hey, guys, thanks again. Uh, another wonderful Thursday a drama show. I don't know what next week's show's going to be. Next week is going to be a really fun week. I'm going to do Mike's AMA on Monday. I've got my Tuesday night show. Uh, I'm doing uh, Core One Study Hall. And uh, I've asked Tulliwit to record that so uh, we can resolve some of the problems that I've got going on here with Hum and Mike. I did record last week's show, and the audio was abysmal. And I spent some time with a, uh, an audio editor. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that has worked out in spades. Thank you very much. And so it's posted, and it's available in the uh, Study Hall Repay Links channel all of the the shows that we've ever recorded steve has recorded some of his own and i'm recording them now uh, you can go check those out i, I know that's total seminar stuff I'm, I'm not supposed to cross over here but uh, that's fair game they won't mind if i promote their stuff as long as i don't compete with them right anything else going on oh yeah and if, uh, so tuesday night the reason that he's uh doing that recording is a i got techno problems here with hum and echo and B, I'm going to be on the road on Tuesday, so I'm going to take a mini studio with me uh, and do it from a hotel. And I'll tell you all about it then. All right, well, let's close this thing up. Thank you, as ever and always. Good view count uh, in grand total. Thanks. The, the show is growing it, very slowly, but uh, she's growing, and it's going to get better and better as we go. But it's, it's so far much better than when we first started, right? I think so. Really? If you do that? Okay, I can do it this way. That'll work. Hey, so I wish you a great rest of the week, all one day of it, and a wonderful weekend. Take care of each other. Take serious steps to stay healthy, and if at all possible, please call or visit your parents. Never forget, technology is great, but the greatest resource we have are still you and I. And so with that, good night. I'll see you on AMA on Monday. Study Hall on Tuesday, and a Dramata on Thursday. Until then, remember, how you do anything is how you do everything. Eep, op, orc, ah, ah. <clears throat>